Hello, brother. Hi. I'm David Gonzalez, one of the six. And it's Hector Mavo once said, Todo tiene su final. So that's the nice theme song. So it could have been Emerson Lake and Palmer. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Take your pick. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, my five brothers in this crazy experiment that we dreamed up three years ago. Um, to my right, Francisco Molina Reyes II. Ricky Flores. Ricky lived on Fox, I lived on Beck. We met his grown men. Go figure. Uh, Edwin Pagan. Joe Conzo Jr. Because seniors are forced to be reckoned with too, but Jr. is holding his own very nicely. Thank you. And the one that I've known the longest, my partner in crime at the New York Times, and I got my job through the New York Times through him, Angel Franco. Um, how to um, summarize this thing? I'm going to sit down. This is going to be very informal. I don't have any prepared statements like I did at the opening, so y'all can relax. Um, we dreamed this thing up, you know, a la brava, three years ago, like, like I said when we opened. We had this crazy idea to throw out some pictures that we took when we were kids. I mean, you know, I was like 19 when I started taking some of the pictures you see in this show. We were all very unformed, very young, very green photographers. Um, some were a little more experienced. Cisco and Franco had, had you know, a little head start on us. And we looked up to them. I looked up to Franco uh, when I was coming up. Um, I have been amazed that this idea that started as like, you know, one of these, hey, let's put on the show type of ideas, how it has taken off in the six, seven weeks that it's been up here at the Bronx Documentary Center. I have seen all manner of people come up here to look at our work and to interact with us and to interact with each other. And it's been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life um, as a photographer, as a journalist, and as someone who was born at St. Francis Hospital about half a mile south of here. Um, what it has been for me has been to see the desire for people to reclaim their history, the need to see the history as we saw it. And by we, I don't mean I mean we, to realize that the communities that we came from, because again, realize the South Bronx is not just one community, but a collection of communities, depending where you're from, or where you hang, um, but that our communities were a lot more complicated than people ever gave us credit for, and that even in the times when things were hectic, when there was straight up mayhem out there, the fact of the matter was, and there was also a lot of strength. There was also a lot of people pulling together in ways large and small, whether it was like, as Joe would say, you know, Doña Fulana down the hall sharing some rice and beans with you because she knew your family didn't have enough, or in big ways. Like, you know, when I looked at people like Astin Jacobo up in, in uh, Cortona, and saw how Jacob organized the Cortona Community Coalition back in the day by challenging Ed Koch at a town hall meeting at St. Joseph's Church on Bathgate Avenue. I was there, I was a journalism student. And I saw the guy who was the, the janitor, the superintendent, the custodian of my grammar school, stand up face to face with Edward I. Koch. The I was his favorite pronoun, they said. You know? But Koch listened to this Dominican immigrant tell him that he was a liar because he did nothing for the community. And Koch, to his credit, actually came back to the community and walked around the streets of Cortona with, with Jacob and started a partnership that helped rebuild that part of the South Bronx. So I think, you know, in, in the midst of our, quote unquote, despair, there were seeds of, of salvation, if you will, if we, if we would get religious about it, if we would get rhapsodic about it. And I tend to get like that sometimes when I think about it, only because we have been, you know, tarred for life because we come from SS We come from the South Bronx. And yeah, damn straight, we come from the South Bronx, whatever. 
because the problem has been that people associate that place, ese sitio, esa gente, with the worst. And forget that, you know, the, in, even in all these pictures that you, you see garbage, roof down buildings, burning buildings, there was strength not too far from all those places. The question is, how do you want to tell the narrative? The narrative of the South Bronx to this day, unfortunately, persists. That is just this godforsaken place of poor people who have brought upon their own misfortune through their own laziness or whatever. It kind of obscures the fact that there are larger demographic, economic, and sociological trends that swirl around the joint. But it's very easy to come looking for what you want to find in the South Bronx and find it. It's like that old commercial where the guy's driving his RV and the, you know, the squirrels are doing all this crazy stuff behind them and he's just looking straight ahead and he doesn't see what's behind them. Um, but if, if you, all you come is looking for people having a hard time, you'll find that. But if you don't look around, then you won't see that there's all this other stuff going on. I think the most rewarding thing about Los Seis has been that we, and again, the inclusive we, not just the six we, have started to shift the narrative of the South Bronx, if you will. We started to take it into a new place. Took it back to its past to bring it into its future and beyond, hopefully. Um, we have seen how this has resonated with younger people and other photographers, and that, that has made all of us very happy. Because when we were doing this work back then, we were kind of like off on our own. We were like all these little, we were in our own little worlds with our cameras, taking our pictures, not realizing there were other people who were doing the same thing. I mean, we didn't meet each other until 2009. When was that at? It was his opening. <laughs> it was Pictures of the Bronx by Joe Conzo Jr. At the library named after his grandmother, Evelina Antonetti, one of the great. That karma thing just hit a smack in the face. It did. It did. It's like this was a show that we had to do. We had to do it because we had all these pictures that were sitting in binders, as I, as I put it once, as like notes to myself from my childhood. You know, 30 years, that picture of the dancers was in a binder for 30 years. I had no idea that picture existed for 30 years until I scanned my negatives. I was like, damn, I took that. <coughs> you know, I did. And I'm very happy to be able to share that with people now. I think the example of the six to anybody who's in any, anything creative is save everything. Don't throw away anything. <laughs> and the digital age it is so easy to save stuff. It's also easy to overshoot. This is, the, this is the flip side of this. The beauty of that era was they didn't have a lot of money. Once the camera counter hit 30, you slow it down. <laughs> you didn't, you didn't it's like, do what, you know, am I going to take more pictures or am I going to have some arroz con longanisa? I mean, you know, that's the choice, okay? Do I eat or do I take, you know, bust out another roll of, of, of film? Uh, and so, you know, because we didn't have enough dough, we had a certain discipline that we developed, if you will. And there's something to be said. I'm not, I'm not you know, being nostalgic. I'm, I'm being very practical. That like you learn to think before you shoot. Whereas in digital jammies, you could just shoot like crazy. But I think the lesson is, you know, save everything. Because you will see things when you get older, as we all did, that we didn't know. <laughs> save that camera. Don't no worry. You're in your house. You're making mistakes here. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> but I think that was the thing that we really came away with that this is all the work of young men who kind of had an idea of what they wanted to shoot. I mean, I, I didn't set out to photograph, document the South Bronx. You know, I, I, I was infatuated with the street photography of Lee Friedlander, who I just thought was God. And Friedlander's work just blew my mind. And I wanted to try to do what he did in the streets of the Bronx. And yeah, you realize ultimately I got to do what I do, not what he did. But that's okay, you work through it. Um, the great thing about this show has just been seeing everybody who's come through here and continues to come through here. I mean, once again, it's like, como, estamos repartiendo queso aquí. I mean, it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, and no, there is no cheese here, okay? So, but still, people show up like crazy. And that, and that just has made it so rewarding for us because if all we're doing is showing each other pictures on Facebook, we're not doing anything. But to show pictures here on the wall, to have a discussion with you, that, for us, has been the most rewarding part of this whole thing. And, you know, I'm not going to yap anymore. You know, I'm just going to throw it open to the other five and, and to all y'all out there and just have a talk about whatever you want to talk about. Hey, David, can we get a second to let some of these people about the door filter? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, man, Todd.
There's a couple of chairs here, somebody can grab them and secure them. And there's another one over here. See, this is how we roll. Our family's rolling into the doors and stuff like that, so we walk on the wall. No, that's what I'm trying to Okay. If I could just get your attention real quick, a couple of shout outs. I'm not going to remember everybody, so don't come up afterwards. I'm sorry. But there are some people here that I do want to single out who are among us. Um, we have Charlie Ahern over here, the, the director of Wild Style, the Seminole. I know Ronnie Puente is around here somewhere. Donde está? We got one of the foremost authors on race in America, Ellis Kosovic, just walked in. Thank you for joining us. And right next to him, we have a king. His mother knows him as Jesus Melendez, but we all know him as Papoleto. Founders of the Real Rican Poetry Movement is with us, and I think if we're nice, he might actually give us a bendición at the end with his words. We're hoping he will. We're hoping he will. Maxi Colón is here. Frank Impaya is here. All those old and focal heads. These George. are the people we looked up to. George Malave is here. That's right. I saw it. Well, I thought George. That con dedo por ahí. Bill Aguado is here. Bill Aguado is here. Help me out, people. Francisco Lugavina. Oh, Olga Luz Tirado from Bronx Tourism. Yasmin Ramirez. <laughs> and, uh, and the coolest brother to ever rock a speed graphics still, Luis Mendez, the best street photographer in New York City. And speaking of photographic royalty, Mel Rosenthal in the United States of the Talking about the South Bronx, we also got the Vice President of the Rocksteady Crew, Jorge Popmaster Fable, and Christy Zipabong, Tools of War, all those great pop jams, and the Rembrandt of the Bronx, Danny Houghton. Sistine Chapel is at Bronx Community College now. If I forgot you, I'm sorry. It's been a long day. It wasn't on purpose. But we'll make it up later. But I'd like to just throw it open to the fellas, to the audience. Y vamos, vamos hablando. Um, I mean, I, I just want to add that it's been, it's been really, really nice seeing something that we started thinking about sort of in, as a sideline. Uh, a couple of guys trying to get together to put up some of their work that we hadn't pulled out of crates or boxes. And like he said, 30, 35 years, um, sort of get the, the reception that it has. And I'm not just saying that from, in, from an egotistical point of view because I think the press has kind of done that, right? I have those little tear sheets that I can always pull out and remember the photos that have been... That's, I, I think that's one of the great things about doing a show when a lot of your friends are artists is it's going to be documented up the ass, right? Because this show has been documented. Um, but I can, in, in, in another 30, hopefully my son who's in the back, Ethan, can pull those out and say, you know, my dad did something, right? And, and to be able to look at those photos that I started taking, actually, he's, he's, he's about to turn 11, that I started taking when I was 10, right? Because I got into photography when I was 10. Um, it, it's kind of humbling, right? Because there were images that when we started scanning them, drum scanning them, thanks to the, uh, the, the center here, the uh, Bronx Documentary Center, to Mike and, and his crew, uh, 
there are photos in there that I hadn't seen. The same way he said he hadn't seen the dancers in 30 years, there were photos in there that I had not seen in 30 to 35 years. Um, you know, like he said, we, we didn't have the money, so a lot of those prints, or if we went through a roll of film, we would pick out one or two that we would eyeball with a loop or hold up to the light just so that we can see, all right, this is, this, I'll print that one. But in many cases, it wasn't the best shot of the roll, right? And while we started looking through the collective work and all the work that we wanted to submit for consideration before they gave it a curatorial eye, there were images found in there that I said, wow. I've been showing the wrong shot from that series. Um, and in many cases, it was something very subtle, but made, it made all the difference. Um, so for me, it's a revelation also to see uh, what I had captured that I hadn't been cognizant existed within that frame of work, and shots that at the time were throwaway shots, where it was just you pass something, you take a snapshot of it, and you look at it 25, 30 years later, and it has an altogether historical significance. One of those shots, which is not here, is a, it's a, a, of a young lady who is actually bent over under the trussels at 180th Street, and she's picking through rubble. And at the time I took the picture, it was just a lady bent over, picking up rocks. Well, when, I, when they scanned the image and sent it to me, because they had scanned it, and as a courtesy, here's your work, you know, which was great. Um, I looked at it, and actually what the young lady was doing was that she was a hooker, unfortunately, from our community. And what she was doing was picking through the little rocks, looking for crack. And if anybody remembers those days, the people that were addicted to crack would do that because they would think that perhaps someone else that was smoking crack in that area probably dropped the rock, and they would score it and smoke it. Well, that image at the time didn't have any significance, but that one shot now, to me, covers a whole spectrum of time of our brothers and sisters who went through that at that time, many of which didn't make it. So a lot of that stuff is in there, and we only are displaying six images per person here, but hopefully going forward, perhaps in a bigger venue, or in book form, or in a website, uh, we can continue to share that work and expand upon it. One of the things that's been tremendous about it has been the public programs that we've done together with BDC, because it's done this. It's brought people out to have discussions, to engage in an issue that shouldn't be forgotten, right? Because the burning of the Bronx and what our people endured in this borough is not something that's going to be forgotten. It's not something that should be forgotten. And even if, if, if worst case scenario, it's so that our children can remember what we went through, that's important. But I think more so that the nation can remember what we went through. Because I think, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things, when you go through trauma, the first inclination of the body is to try to, uh, you know, keep you away from that so you don't feel the pain, so that the memory is repressed. But that's also a dangerous thing when it comes to our historical legacy. And I think this exhibit in its own way begins to bring that to the forefront and also, um, you know, preserve it for the future. I think one of the things that happened that's really cool with Joe is that his work has now been uh, preserved in a bit, in a very big way, and I think that that's the first of more to come. Um, but, you know, it's great, like he says, that his work is going to be sitting next to the Gettysburg Address. You know, that's phenomenal that a part of our history has been encapsulated in that way for the future to kind of explore, right? Because I think the Bronx in 50 or 60 years is going to be a much different place. And just the way we think of World War II is something that we can't even imagine in the way that it actually occurred because it's 60, 65 years ago. Well, think about what they'll think about what happened in the 70s, 80s, 80 years into the future. And I think it's all beginning. So I'm really glad that you guys have come out to support this because if you guys hadn't come out, it would just be printed paper on the wall. You guys have given those images meaning, and I thank you guys for that. Um, I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming out, um, coming out, supporting this uh, endeavor of ours for the last six to eight weeks. I, I just want to go tell you something real briefly. I love these guys up here, okay? 
If you don't know, Francisco Reyes is my mentor. He taught me photography at United Bronx Parents, an organization my grandmother started in the late 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, and I look up to Ricky Flores, you know, him and I shot during the same time about five blocks from each other. We missed and each other by seconds. By <laughs> seconds. And a lot of our work is compared because we hung out with the same people. Um, David, who I had known about because they spoke about him at the dinner table, did a story on me about <coughs> seven years ago. Yes. Yeah. About seven years ago. And gave me the, the the title, the man who took hip hop's baby pictures, and because of David's article in the New York Times, I've been traveling the world, and I want to thank David for that. Um, Edwin here is another name that was spoken at the dinner table, but I found out later on worked real closely with my aunt Elbert Cabrera, who ran uh, AHA, the Association of Hispanic Arts, mm -hmm. which, Ricky, us, which Ricky worked at. Including that man over there, too. Peter and, uh, <laughs> you know, Edwin interviewed me for his film on the Bronx's burning, and we got real close. And Valerino over here, <laughs> I, just, I just looked up to his work because this man, you know, I wanted to be him. Angel traveled the world. I mean, in my high school. I'm him. I'm him. Traveled the world, and I wanted to be that world famous photographer traveling the world, working for at that time UPI. You know, not as good looking. It's not. It doesn't exist anymore. But this is the man I looked up to. So I just want to say I love these guys up here. You know. Thank you. Um, this, this exhibition has been a, a, a truly a blessing for me. I grew up two blocks down here at Michelangelo's. I was one of the first families to move in there. And um, for, the, for the people that came and saw the exhibition before it was taken down, one of the shots was, that I took was right here on Cortland Avenue during uh, a Fort Apache demonstration. Okay, And Fort Apache was a movie made with Paul Newman that uh, my grandmother, Evelyn Antonetti, organized along with Richard Perez and, and other community activists and demonstrated against the movie Fort Apache. And it was a huge win for the community of the South Bronx because if you look at the movie today, you know, 30 years later, there's a disclaimer in the beginning of the movie that the movie doesn't betray the blacks and Latinos of the Bronx as pimps drug addicts or anything like that. So that was a huge win for the Bronx and, and the people of the Bronx. Um, so coming here to do an exhibition to me was like coming home. And it, it, you know, again, like David mentioned earlier, it was at one of the shows that I did at Hunter College that we all just came together and we just started brainstorming. And you know, I gotta be totally honest and I'm not gonna pull any punches here. We approached a lot of institutions here in the Bronx, and nobody wanted to do it. Really? Nobody. And it wasn't until Mike Camber, Danielle, the beautiful volunteers here at the Bronx Documentary Center, said, said, we'll do it. And let me tell you, that was a blessing in disguise. Everything happens for a reason. And we did it here, and it's been a huge, huge, huge success. And that, to me, is just a blessing in disguise. And, again, you know, I've exhibited all of I just came back from Paris last weekend doing a show over there. But there's nothing like doing a show where you grew up at, you know, at home. I'm sorry. But that is, to me, the fact. Again... I want to thank Mike, Danielle, Katie, all the volunteers here at, at the BDC who volunteered their time, you know, you know, Tuesday through Sunday to keep this place open. We've had so many schools come through here That's and so many programs come, you know, kids come here. There's nothing, you know, I can't keep what I have unless I give it away. <laughs> and there's nothing like giving it away to the young kids of, of, of the neighborhood. And that to me is just phenomenal. <coughs> And um, just thank, thank you all. Thank you.
Thank you for believing in us, for sharing our vision, our strengths, hopes, and experience. And uh, that's it. Thank you. about the show is the fact that Michael and Daniel have given have given voices to these images that no one has respected anywhere else. I did I did this series on the four six precinct and I've been everywhere and no one believed that this was happening in America. You know, no one would respect the work. They love the work, but they wouldn't respect it by saying, here's the story. You know look at these folks, and because they weren't just, you know, wham, bang, thank you, ma'am. They were photographs of people. So, we all get together, as you know the history now. We end up eating at Pio Pio, right? We ate chicken. It was cheap. Um, and said, let's try and put this together. And yes, we, w we went out and talked to groups of people, and they had good intentions. You know, but the people that they thought also would have the same intentions didn't. You know, so we were sort of like uh, wandering photographers <laughs> of New York, not having a voice to put these images up. Um, I was lucky that the, the New York Times lens block ran about 18 of the series uh, 30 years later. Mm. You know. The Leica Gallery at downtown Manhattan, because I, you know, but, uh, I won that Leica Medal of Excellence and all this other stuff, so they pulled me in like, oh yes, oh yes, and then when I left the box there uh, for weeks, my wife was, kept asking, so what's going on? And I said, oh, so we called them up, and do you have anything else? <laughs> <laughs> you know, which I find very interesting, because if we were having bloody people in Afghanistan or Latin America or anywhere else in the world, we are putting those up in the front pages of the newspapers, putting them up in TV. Everyone is really concerned that you know women in other countries can't read and write, um, that there are children starving in other countries. Meanwhile, there's a lot of women in this neighborhood that still can't read and write. Still you know, there's a lot of children here not eating or being educated. There's a lot of stuff that <coughs> People say have changed, but when I drive and walk through these streets, I haven't seen the change. And I'm looking at the street as a parent, you know, not as a photographer or someone else or someone who knows the community. I am looking at 62 at the community as a parent, you know. And I'm happy that this place, the BDC, and Mike decided to put his money into this place, and Danielle is putting in her life into this place, so that these images can have a voice, that the people in the community can have a voice, and then when you look out into a crowd and you see a lot of brown faces, white faces, black faces, all different colors, and you go, damn, this is sweet. You know, <laughs> there is a character. There's something happening. So, and it takes it even beyond, you know, Latins and black folks in the, of the community. It takes it on now to a different uh -huh. area. It's about us, people, you know, which is even more exciting for me because it it's lost that whole thing of you people, you know, it's humans, so I like that. So I wish to again thank all of you, and uh, and if you want to see the rest of my pictures, I picked this up from Joe Gonzo. <laughs> <laughs> my website is angelfrancophotography.com. Angel Franco. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't able to participate in a lot of things here because I had a knee replacement, so I couldn't be standing around, and, uh, and so I missed some of the fun and wonderful experiences of the children coming in, but I kept seeing the uh, pictures. These guys kept sending me pictures, like, look at what you're missing. So, uh, but I'm here tonight, and I really, really, really thank you, and my wife thanks you too, you know, because it kept me occupied. Uh, that's all to me. Thank you.
can only speak for myself in terms of being moved to towards and this is in it. And it stems from, from two events, and one is during the time when uh, Joey Council approached me in the photography workshop to further his studies in black and white photography during that era there. You gotta realize that a lot of these pictures and, and the whole body of work that still is yet to be seen were taken by a lot of these young men at, when they were teenagers. I, I was already older. Teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> I was older also. I'm the preceding generation. You know, I, I grew up with the South Side era and everything, and they grew up with the hip hop era. Um, that is the, uh, very rewarding to see how far these young men have come with their work, their photography, their seriousness of the craft, their, their formation of their eye and composition, particularly with Joey and with Ricky, who's, who has a deep, deep body of work. And this is a man that started yes, taking yes. pictures when he was oh, like, what, 10, 11, something like that, along with Edmund. And, and, um, but some of us photography started later in our late teens, 19, maybe early 20s. And, and that is one of the, the most rewarding things. The other rewarding thing was opening night here, mm -hmm. when fathers, mothers brought their, their sons and daughters, some of them holding cameras. And, and they wanted them to meet us, you know, to see what we had done here, achieved here in terms of this exhibit. And they were aspiring to be photographers. And, and I mean, you want your son to be a, 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 a daughter to be a doctor or a lawyer or some or a teacher, but still, photography is something that we should always you know, reinforce in our children because it helps develop other skills in terms of visual and everything. And, and, and that is the other thing that I work with. So I thank you all for that, for that reward that I, uh, I'm enjoying late in my life. I guess I will talk it from the personal perspective. Photography pretty much saved my life. Um, it it weaved and informed who I was as a young kid growing up in the South Bronx, trying to define myself as a Puerto Rican man, born and raised here, and but not having that connection with the with the island, not having that connection with being truly American, and trying to find what my place was but also what was going on in my community. And it seemed to inform almost every single thing that I've done throughout my life. And many of the people who, who helped shape that are sitting in this room today. You know, that in a way that I wouldn't be able to have survived. Everywhere from the, the children that I grew up with, the same brothers that I hung out with, who I hang out in the room here, who come back? Who come back to take a look? Hey, I, I remember you. You know, these are my photographs. Remember you took that photograph? Yeah, and that's yours. You know, it belongs to you. You know, it's like you know being able to give something back that I created so long ago. Um, but it also was a way for me to identify who I was as an individual. <laughs> yeah, that's what you, um, it's, it's a way to, to identify myself as an individual, as a photographer, and I, but also as a young Puerto Rican man growing up in the South Bronx. Um, now, in a strange way, it's doing it again, exactly the same thing. You know, redefining who I am as a man, you know, as a fully grown man. A full, you know, fully realized career. You know, every like every single individual that's sitting on this panel today, and you know, deciding what the future brings. You know, we've come this far. You know, we built this thing, and what does it mean? And I think for us that the reality of of what we've done is that, despite the fact that this work is deeply personal to each and every single one of us sitting here on this panel. It belongs to each and every single person that's sitting in this room. And this is not about my history anymore. This is about, this is about everybody's history sitting in this room. So, I want to thank you all, those of you who have been through me through this journey, those of you who are sitting here today, you know, showing your love and your respect for me. 
and also, you know, for giving me your love, each and every single one of you. And I just guess I want to you know, profoundly thank you from all of us, the six here. But I want to particularly thank this brother right here, who found us all and just kind of weaved us all together as the master wordsmith that he is and as the photographer that he is um, and made those connections and those long, long, long hours talking about, you know, the future of what we wanted to do and how we we're going to get here and kind of like in a strange way, you know, honoring the karma that put us all together in this room, you know, put the six of us together in this room. You know, that there was a power there that we, I, you know, I'm not a religious person, you know. Um, mm. But I consider myself in some way spiritual, but also consider that stuff does happen for a reason. And the signs kept coming and hitting us, you know, like out of the blue. It's like, you know, wow, it's crazy. I just, I started looking at some of the images, the very first images that were me, you, and I and met. You know how many frames I took? Six. Yeah, I, I just saw that last night, you know. When we had the panel discussion last week, there was a Monsignor sitting right here in this chair, actually the chair that I'm sitting at, talking about the history of the South Bronx. And the name kept bothering me. You know, it was like, who is this brother? Who is this guy? Monsignor Connolly. And, and, and as he started unraveling his story, he was a pastor of St. Athanasius Church. That brother baptized me. <laughs> it was like, holy crap. So, and not only did he baptize me, I took communion with him for three years, and I totally forgot about it. And I ran home to my wife, and I said, I think I just met the guy who baptized me. And I went to the papers, and sure enough, there's his name. His signature scrolled out on that paper. It was those little instances that continued to inform what, we were ha what was happening to us. Everything from that small thing of Mike Camber throwing that photograph on the wall of the break dancer and, and the two couples dancing and having somebody walk by running back to find the husband of the woman that was dancing and say, hey, you know, somebody took a picture of your wife and it's hanging on the wall. Yeah, Mike was like this because the husband comes in, the guy was huge. I mean, he was a huge guy and, and when he said you could took you guys took a picture of my wife and Mike step, steps back you know, like, uh, like, you know, what? You know oh. I took a picture of your wife you know he was about to take a hit for me that he, he didn't know even happened you know it started like 80 years ago in, in, in the 1980s and um, and and she and it turns out she is she lives down the block you know still has the same long blonde hair still dancing, um, still dancing and you know and walked into walked into this place, you know, at first, you know, really hesitant, and the next thing you know, she was like the star of multiple interviews, getting handshakes from Phenomenal <laughs> Career, you know. She was acting like this major star. And, and that, I mean that that's the extreme element of it. But the other element of it is homeboys, people that I grew up with reclaiming their history and saying, you know, I remember you, but I don't remember what it was like growing up back then. And, and the profound in, the implications of what that means, you know, that, you know, in some sense, for some people, the history of the South Bronx was lost. But, and we gave them the opportunity to say, this is yours, you know, this belongs to you. This is, you know, this is, this is how life's work, but, you know, I, I got my career, you know, I put my, I'm putting my kids through school. You know, I'm actually, you know, ending that part of my life, but this part... This now belongs to you, and and here we are today. We need to have that. From the door, you guys are kind of Yeah, come on in. You know, we'll work yourselves in. Spread in. You want floor? Take floor. You want to move a, a seat corner? Here. Take corner. There's a seat here. There's one seat right here. Don't be afraid, don't be shy. I think you want to interrupt your dialogue. No, no, it's all right. Particularly me? Yeah, especially for you, it's okay. So, um, we want to continue that, we want to continue that history for all y'all, you know, like it, we're turning this thing over to you, and, and it's fitting that right now, at this particular moment, 
that we it's the it, it's it's the last day of the show for us. But I know for the six of us, you know, very clear, you know, the the old man of the panel made gave us our marching order and said, Yo, we gotta do something, you know. Mm -hmm. We gotta do something else. We can't stop here. And we gotta bring this wealth and you know, this breadth of experience back into the community. But more importantly, we wanna continue that dialogue with all of you here. And so we're just gonna open it up and you know, so take questions. I'm wondering if you could take a minute and talk about Carlos Ortiz because his pictures are cool. Ah, thank you. This um, is a visit. Um, you, know, you actually you do that. You do. Carlos Ortiz was a, a local neighborhood photographer who who many of us looked up to or knew of, never got to met meet, but Carlos recently died a couple of years ago and this exhibition is a homage to him. And Carlos Ortiz documented, you know, the South Bronx, United Bronx parents, the Bronx politicians, uh, salsa, pretty much everything. You know, he lived on, on Kelly and back around there and just, you know, photographed everything. And um, if you notice, there's some pictures there. So he recently passed away a couple years ago and his work is pretty much obscure. People really don't, can't see his work or anything like that and you know one of the reasons I just did what I did and Eddie mentioned it earlier I just deposited you know 15,000 of my negatives up in Cornell University yeah. so it's going to be digitized and preserved for hundreds and hundreds of years and I don't want that work to be lost like I've lost stuff over the years and like Carlos's work is in boxes, you know, it's in somebody's basement. So that's why I did that. But Carlos is, you know, we looked up to him, at least I did. And um, this show is dedicated to Carlos Ortiz. So Carlos is for you. Questions, questions, statements, throw them out. Yeah, why do you, why do you think that the um, that organization where you, I forgot the yeah, Leica were rejected doing oh. the exhibition <laughs> when you when you brought all the photographs? To well, them, why it, do you think? I, that? I, I think that uh, <laughs> I, I think that people weren't ready for it. They couldn't understand this it was really happening in the five, within the five boroughs, and they weren't pretty pictures. I think there's also, there's also um, I, I, I don't know, throw a positive note in there. That there's picture was taken on Portland Avenue. A lot of those institutions are uh, focused on developing <coughs> new talent, young talent. And so they're caught up in the kind of what they call Puerto Rican type of thing. I like that. Puerto Rican. Rican light. Yeah. Rican light. Rican light. Yeah. Rican light. Rican that's not to say that there were people who, who were advocating for us and there was yeah, yeah. there was Bill Guado sitting in the back, you know. We had the deep misfortune that that he had already retired and broke out, you know, so the influence that he would have leveraged would, would be I, I had no doubt whatsoever that it would have happened exactly the way you know it should have happened. Yeah, but I think, you know I think I apologize another, that it didn't stop. Stop. No. stop. Well, you did not the, you fact, don't, you, the fact of the matter is that here no so much more ideal because people can walk through those doors, walk past the street, oh, yeah. and say, what's happening in here? What's up with that? And they can just literally walk right in, whereas in other <laughs> venues, they'd have to go into a place that they may not feel comfortable with and go check it out. Think, I, I'll go right here, okay. Yeah. You know? So, you know, but but here they can walk by and see it, right. see a picture yeah. and say, it looks like somebody I know, actually. <laughs> they come in. There's a whole different dynamic. So in, in a way, this is the best possible place to show this. Right, right. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I just want to reiterate about that journey and stuff. Bill of Guado gave me a lot of freelance work, you know, mm -hmm. and, and put that money in my pocket so I can buy that film to do the very thing that's hanging up on this wall. So, you know, he ain't got, he, he don't have to explain himself to me, ever. <laughs> you know? no, no, I think, uh, you know, one of the other things that's sort of a back office thing that also occurs is that the institution that we were going to was also an institution that has to that has a cur curatorial process in place, which means they just can't throw, as as BDC could, because it's a smaller institution, 
they couldn't just throw exhibit up. They already have, they work through. Ooh, nice, Eddie. I'm, no, because I, 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 I've also worked the curatorial, so I'm just trying to be fair. And what happens sometimes when you're big institutions, you also have to do an application process to get the grants and cycles, whether it's NISCA, et cetera. But the truth is, it's not Hispanic month. So, <laughs> let's deal with the facts. I used to go to Newsweek, oh, we're not hiring any, uh, back then it was Spanish. Oh, well, I'm not Spanish, Puerto Rican. You know? um, the racism within this business, you know, was unbelievable, and still is unbelievable. You know, when, when you have young people starting in this business thinking that they're the first ones, you know, when I've been in this business for over 30 years, I've been in this business since I was 18, I'm 62 now, you know, and dealt with the racist issues, or as a new immigrant, you can do this, that's what I'm not an immigrant, I'm an American citizen. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of issues that are in the back of my head, and they work on me sometimes, and I still go, puñeta, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, you, you have to, as I like to say, you have to dance with them, you know, and you do the dance, and kick in the door, and then, what Ben Fernandez, you know, who was the director of the photo film workshop, said, then, then stick your arm out real fast and pull up the next son of a bitch, <laughs> you know, his words, so, um, and I think this show is doing that, exactly that. You know, this building is doing that. You know, uh, we're doing that. You guys are here are doing that. You know, um, so, uh, but it's like, and we're not going to get into the achievement of, yeah, right. you said this, you Let's said that, going. because you know what? We got to get past yeah. that shit. It's, yep. it's, it's, no, it's we're here. We're here. We're here. We're back. So we're the here. Is That's it. It's done. done with, and it's we're it's just going to continue kicking doors. Did you have any like a uh, girl or women that were you know like like adolescent young women who were also uh, using a Pentax, the thirty-five millimeter still camera? Did you ever run into them? Yeah, like, Carmen Mujica was one of the, those photographers, and and for whatever reason we couldn't get in contact with her. When we tried to, she didn't have equipment to do her scanning. She's in the middle, Puerto Rico, right? and she's in, she also lives in Puerto Rico at this point. Um, a formidable photographer, you know, and you know, we, and as and the thing is, as many of us exactly like that, you know, out there, including you know Carlos Ortiz's work, you know, um, and I think for us, I, for what, what took place on this panel, and I, and I, and I, and I, 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 I can't, no other words to say, I shit you not, you know, this this kismic thing, this karma thing kept rolling through our group in a way, that, in, in a powerful way. I guess for, for us, for many of us, we were going through a host of personal issues, you know, um, ranging, you can just range it, you know, and you, every single, single thing that, that was going, that could possibly happen to an individual as a group, we all experience it, you know, and, and but, you know, for somehow through that, it kept on, this, this single thing, this single idea kept us, cohesive as a group and you know the and the work the focus on that work um was powerful it was a powerful draw for us i think you know we, when we started out talking about it it was somebody this thing happened organically it was six of us at this at this opening sort of throwing down pictures and realizing where things were coming from and that we had been in the same places when we started meeting more formally we started thinking about who are some of the people that should be involved and that's when ricky mentioned Carmen. We thought about some of the other folks. There were other folks who did some work in the Bronx at the time, you know, people like Pela de Leon, people like Evelyn Collazo, but not to the extent of the, of the work that we had been doing. One of the great things about the show was at the opening, Pela and Evelyn were here, and like, the first thing we all said to Pela was, okay, like phase two has to come into effect now, mm -hmm. which is to bring in those folks that were shooting, not just here, but shooting the Puerto Rican community in other parts of the city. And so that way, people like Bella can come in. And finally, Bella was saying she's going to go see Carmen. And I said, listen, I talked to Carmen about a year ago. And I told Carmen, here are some scanners you can buy on eBay. And it didn't happen. So I said to Bella, just get her negatives. We all got scanners. Just get her negatives. Get this. She tells us which frame she wants scanned. And we'll do it. So we'll make it happen to bring in a broader vision, basically. So I mean, that's, you know, that, that was on our mind from the beginning. But the thing was, the person that you know, Ricky said had to be in there, Carmen, we couldn't track her down for like a year and a half. I have a question. Yeah. Um, 
question. Do you plan to actually make this into a book? We got I'm plans. just asking. We got, we got plans. We got plans. We're, we're looking at different ways of, of, of doing it. We all have book ideas. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's one of the things we're talking about. Yeah, and I mean, that would open it up because we also have so many more shots that we just couldn't use here, which have gotten scanned, uh, high resolution. Um, yeah, due to space. Um, and, and actually, one of the things I, I, I keep pointing out every time I say this in terms of BDC here is that the exhibit got mounted the same way as any world-class gallery anywhere else you could find. Now, you just came from Paris. Does this hold up? Beyond. Beyond. You know, so, folks like Mike, Danielle, Katie, everyone here that, I mean, they were, I mean, the, the, Cara, everyone, I mean, they, they, the thing was that they helped us so much on every level, not just selecting the work and how it would go together, they helped us design the flyers every time we had a public program for an event that we did every Saturday, we'd have a flyer. You know, it, it was just incredible because there was that whole support. It's, it's almost like the support we weren't getting throughout those 35 years got condensed into like, you know, the last four months. You know, it was like that super concentrated adobo, you know, it was like all of a sudden, <laughs> boom, in one, in one shot. By people who knew us and loved us. Exactly. You know, so, I mean, that was fantastic. It's almost like going into B&H and they tell you, take anything you want. <laughs> so, 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 so what you that yet? <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was that kind of thing, you know, and, and for us, um, so it, 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 it allowed us to really think about what we were doing. And one of the things... Because he's pulled the trigger to, you know, to tell us, you know, we got to take this forward. And the last panel we did here, we looked at each other and we said, we know where this is going. Because we've opened up a conversation that is not going to be, it's not going to go away at this point. But also that there's a need for this kind of stuff. So we can see ourselves continuing to do panels on various discussions associated with what, what happened in the Bronx, but also how it impacts and it's also connected with other discussions, right? There's issue of highest asthma rate in the country, in our neighborhood, right? There's corporations that try to move in and offer a few jobs and basically reclaim land that for nothing. You know, th those are all issues that have to be put on the table. And if our politicians don't do it, then we'll do it and make it an issue, right? And there are people stepping up to the plate that are saying enough is enough. Right? Some of them are ready to run out for office now. So I think we can act as a catalyst on a grassroots level to kind of do that. Right? And there's nothing stopping any of you here, if you belong to an organization, saying, listen, uh, we, have, we have a group of children that would like to know more about this. Come on in. You know, if all six of us can't do it, we do like what we were doing here. They let us know there's a group of kids coming in from ICP or Tribeca Film Academy. Or and at least, one, exactly, at least one of us would be here. Right, to guide them through and give them some context. So please invite us out. If you have an idea of where else we can take this, throw it on the table. This is virgin territory for us. Huh? So you're also saying we should support the Bronx Documentary Center? Absolutely. This place, okay, this is a totally biased opinion, but, but you can trust me. And this place, you know, pulls Comprende rabbits out of hats. Yeah. I mean, this place <laughs> makes something out of nothing. You look at, like, the, the flyers for our shows. I mean, for those of you who grew up, like, looking at Buddy Esquire flyers, I mean, this is, like, a whole different level with Katie Corey. The stuff that she does with her flyers is... <laughs> I mean, you look at... There's a, there's a collector's box set that's being put together. I mean, quality materials. You look at the way... This show just gets put together. I mean, when Mike pulled the trigger on the show in October, said we're gonna do it. Mm. It was like a well-oiled machine. It was like boom, 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 boom. Things got done. And this is a nonprofit art space. I mean, listen, there's no doubt about the quality of programming here. This is there is no programming like this anywhere in the city that brings these kind of crowd together. What they need is dope. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna be blunt. They need dope. And CD, that's catchment. And that's what we're talking about. But really, I mean, you know, everything else, you know, I mean, they, they really do an amazing job here. 
you know, with very, very little. They really know how to stretch a buck here. I mean, it's almost like they grew up eating government cheese or something, because they know how to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you're scared. I kind of like to really push that point again. The, the, the journalists that are walking into this room that are, are teaching the kids in this community and, and, and the future generation of, or the next generation of journalists are top world-class journalists, the best. Some of them are confident photographers, you know, weary from wherever they came from, and they'll say, you know, I got to do something, and something completely different. They've had Academy Award winning documentary directors. The guy who did Born into Brothels gave a workshop here. Sebastian Younger, you might have read his book. Perfect Storm. He gave a writing workshop here. And the BDC gives scholarships to Bronx students to go to those events. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this place makes a lot of amazing things happen. Now, the thing is, um, you, know, it's, you know, it's hard economic times, and you may be thinking it's hard to give something, but it, it's, not always, it's not always pull something out of your pocket. I mean, I see some kick-ass people, administrators everywhere. And it's about connecting those dots. It may not be that you pull out a dollar out of your pocket, but if you know of a grant make a phone that's call. coming, let them know that fits. If you know an opportunity uh, with something in the city and you know that it would fit because it's economic development or you know, community development uh, based, what's, what's more than what's happening here to develop our community? So it's, it's also thinking about those things and picking up, uh, you know, picking up the phone and letting them know, listen, this is coming down the pipe. You might want to get down with this. Or listen, we just we got this little block grant or something. You know, it's, it's that kind of stuff because, you know, this could be here a year from now, two years from now, but it might not if we don't support it, right? And it would be a shame, right? Yeah. This what's happening here, you know, I, I always like to use the example, like how many people said they went to Woodstock, right? You had 100,000 and like... <laughs> 50 million claim to have been there. <laughs> well, you guys, through in this process, whether whatever people think about what happened here at this point in time, in 20 years, people can say, yeah, I was there. Right? You guys can actually say you were there. And it's helping, helping the organization connect those dots so that in 20 years, they say, yeah, I remember, I remember that and we're still here. Yeah. Let me ask you something. Do you think that there's such a thing as like a New York Rican sensibility in terms of the Shooting or like a, an aesthetic that can be characterized as New Yorican? To some degree. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, well, well, the deal is, I mean, New Yorican is a, is, is a, a, Puerto, a, a person of Puerto Rican descent who, Which I who, hate grew up, who grew up in New York. He doesn't like it. I hate it. I don't, and, like, it. Uh, I don't like it. I hate it. He I hates like, it. You start calling yourself something else, and everybody thinks it's like yeah, they, can, they can use it to call you anything else. You know, I don't give myself. My mother called me a Puerto Rican. That's what I call myself, and that's who I am. There you go. I'm not a New York nada. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, that's me. That's um, I'm not one part of the no, younger uh, side. True. But you know, um, I I, class, yeah. I classify myself as, as a photographer, like everybody else in this room. Right, but you think there's a, uh, aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic, a sensibility that could be, that, that has certain traits that you all share that other photographers don't? Or do you just think, well, we're just photographers? Yeah, we, we, we're, 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 the, we're, the, we're in the business of caring, like most everybody else in here. No, I got, I, got, I got a real simple answer. Your Joe, stand up and turn around. One in the Bronx. I, I would like to uh, amend all six of you for unwittingly documenting the, uh, the effects of plant shrinkage and uh, disinvestment by government and its citizens. And I think you know, those photographs give context to that reality of surviving in this world and many other urban communities across this country. So I think this exhibit will give genesis to a plethora of, you know, others. Other, I think you've touched a nerve. It's, Thank it's you. time for it. it. It resonates throughout the city. You see, uh, it's <coughs> hard to work in this on a daily basis and, and look back, you know, because you've got to dodge the train coming to the town. I wouldn't expect that any of the larger, more established institutions can even understand 
mm. context in which you're presenting your work, because they are prompted in large by folks who wanted to um, elevate the one of the creators of Plan Trinkage, where I just started, and apparently her and Zara, those of us who you lived through this, and uh, that's an important reality that gives me to the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. things about some of the parents that came through there that lived through this era and had children and they brought their children with them and suddenly their children are seeing how their parents, what they grew up with, what they, what they survived and suddenly you see like the parents suddenly taking the main, the main role again of, of storytelling. Where, uh, you know, these days kids uh, get into psilocybin polo, you know, and all, uh, now, now you have parents again telling their children, this is what it was like. Now children, can, they relate to the visual of it, because uh, we're living in a visual society now. And, and, and that, was, that was a very, very uh, uh, valid and strong point that was made in terms of the whole lineage there. Did you ever think of taking the exhibition to Puerto Rico? Yeah. 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 Well, at this point, we'll take it anywhere they want it. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Has there been anyone that was interested in yeah, there Puerto is. Rico? Yeah, there is. No, there's somebody that's already made overtures about somebody we know. Yeah. 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 Really we we travel anywhere. I got that. <laughs> keep them coming, and keep them coming. Keep them coming. And about the near week in consciousness, we got Papoletto here. Mm -hmm. we'll back that up. <laughs> you got to talk to our head. You guys got to get together. No fist fight. Questions, questions, come on guys, gals. Up here, there's a hand up here. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, for me the importance of this is that, you know, we're telling our own story. Because for a long time, you know, people were telling it for us. Mm -hmm. We're trying to represent our own, you know, our reality. So I think... The most important thing is that hey, we can we can do our own narrative. You know, this is our narrative, and, and we own it. Thank you. Thank you. Mira, quién llegó? Question over there. Right here. Yep. You said something interesting about, I think it was the process of relating to what America meant um, being Puerto Rican from the Bronx, and how would you say that play out in the work in a way that we did? Well, in so many different ways. It's, it's, it's a deeply personal journey and stuff, you know, the discovering, you know, that you have a history that's far, far richer than, mm -hmm. you know, the block that you lived on, you know, yeah. and, and, then, and then making those connections and weaving those stories of an island that you only knew through the, uh, through the words of your mother, you know, for me, I was, yeah. you know, that's, that's how I knew Puerto Rico, you know, mm -hmm. and that, you know, that, you know, and those, those times when I was able to talk about that and um, with, with her about that, but again, is and then, making those connections with people and community and talking about that history. We knew we were Puerto Rican. And we knew, and we knew, the ex and we knew that we had a connection to that island, but we also knew that we were born in the United States as well. And, but we didn't feel that connection. We knew we were outside. How would we say that we were American when the very country was destroying our community, you know? So we were getting hit from that end, and that having that disconnect from, um, um, uh, at least for me personally, from the island as well. So, but you know, that camera began to make those connections and make those understanding, mm -hmm. make that understanding. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting for me because my, um, uh, several of my grandparents grew up in the South Bronx in this predominantly Jewish community in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Mm -hmm. And it also, similarly, for people who came from an Eastern European Jewish background, it's kind of a place where 
they were first generation Americans who cared for the Lower East Side. Um, my grandmother grew up first in Charlotte Street, actually, mm -hmm. and then on Sheridan Avenue, the mm -hmm. concourse. Um, and then it was a place when there was, in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and there was a lot of anti Semitism in overall society. It was kind of like you could be American, but only within the boundaries of the Bronx, within a community that's 99% Jewish. Wow. If you were to leave that and go anywhere else, you would still be considered a minority, wow. and not at the same level, not white, not um, privileged. Um, and so it was kind of this, and again, I think it's interesting to see the show for me and parallel that kind of that experience of assimilation as one of first generation, how do you maintain a connection to um, your heritage and then also being American at the same time and the way that plays out in self-representation is really interesting. Well, I mean, it's interesting also that, because one of the things we've had discussions about is, and I think this happens in, 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 in Puerto Rican culture as a whole, uh, because we're all Puerto Rican men, but I think in, in Puerto Rican culture, it's, it's the fact Puerto Rican society has gone through much where we're, it's almost like our identity is always threatened by either first colonialism on the island, uh, immigrating here, trying to sort of assimilate. And I think it's probably one of the cultures that has fought that the most, right? Because you, you, when I visit the island, which is every once in a while, not very frequently, but my friends there, my family members, they say, I'm more Puerto Rican than they are. And by what they mean by that is that I adhere to a lot of the traditions and, and, and the idiosyncrasies more than people on the island because they take it for granted, right? And it's almost, a, it's almost on my end, it's almost an exaggerated form of it. You know what I mean? Um, and to that degree, I think that happens in cultures where uh, you are kind of fenced into a certain degree where you aren't part of mainstream society or people are telling you aren't this or you yeah. need to negate that or you need to forget about that and like join the rest of us. And I think, I mean, we're here, right? We're part of the American fabric. There's no doubt about that. But we've also maintained our culture, right? With our parades and our, our events, the uh, our language, right? I mean, I can speak fluent Spanish. And that's because my parents uh, always made sure that in the house uh, they spoke Spanish, right? Um, my 10-year-old my back there uh, speaks Spanish. You know, because his mother made sure that that's all how she spoke to him. He has the best Dominican accent you ever want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because that's like his mother's Dominican, and so uh, they made sure that, you know, so he has that, that kind of accent when he speaks it. But it's great, right? And, and it also opens you up to be able to speak to, you know, what is it, 50 whatever million more? Monton. Monton. A lot. A lot. But, 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 but you know... It, 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 like your family, you know, and Passover, we, our Passover was every day yeah. because they, they kept enforcing it. This is what you, we're here, this is where you come from, you know. Very similar, like the, the Jewish community that was here one time, you know, is we're here, but you're really from over there. They're going to treat you different. The, you guys could pass a little faster than we could. You know, you could, you could get on the train and people wouldn't leave the seat, you know, or clutch their purses. But, you know, we were very similar culturally. Family, community, you know, uh, sharing, you know. And I'm married to a Jewish woman, and I said, you know, very similar stuff we're going through here. There's a lot of stuff that you guys do that we do, and, we, and it's become like... You know, wow, yeah, we do that too. The only thing is we, we have to do it every day, <laughs> you know, because we don't know where we're going to live next, yeah. you know. And, 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 the, and yes, and, and, and the same, it's, I mean, it's really amazing how both communities are so similar, you know, and yet so different. But um, culturally, I think uh, there's a lot there. And like, you know, and if you walk down the street and you go into uh, somebody else's house, and sit there for a long time, you go, oh my God, it's all about family. You know, it's about, you know, this is where you're from. And some folks just don't express that the way we do. Yeah. And, you if, you, and if you go down to the Tenement Museum in the Lower East Side, look what's up on the walls that they talk about. It yeah. is the, Porter, uh, the Jewish community and the mm -hmm. Puerto Rican community, the two communities that were living in the Lower East Side. At one time more Jewish, at one time very Puerto Rican. Now together, but always kind of mm -hmm. uh, almost echoing yeah. the same mm -hmm. similar of coming in and the way we lived and and in the same places. You know, and, so and, you know, and, our, and our trips that our parents would take us back to the island, right? It's very similar to, you know, you, you're going home yourself. 
you know, and, yeah. and, and I, I see with my wife's family where you do that trip to Israel, you know, this is we, this is yours, this is, you know, and they rub your head into the uh, sand. Well, we got rubbed into that sand on the beach also. You know, at Orchard. At Orchard. Listen. We're going home. We had to end it at Orchard Beach. Right? Um, before we go, we want to, first of all, we want to thank all of you for all the times, because there's some people who came here several times, multiple times. I mean, Bobby Sinavia just got off a plane and came here again. <laughs> Proud son of Melrose. And son of Hayes. I have to give the gratuitous Hayes plug as a oh, Hayes man. Right. <laughs> hey, they will cold crush pictures playing. I know, I know. So, yeah, I'm sorry. The Catholic school crowd, you know? But, seriously, I mean, you know, your presence here has been a true gift to us um, as photographers, as Bronxites, as Puerto Ricans, as neighbors. And so, for the six, I want to thank you deeply. To Mike, Danielle, Katie, Ed Garcia Conde, Kara, all the volunteers here, thank you so much for making this happen. It's been an amazing and a hell of a ride. And I think what we'd like to do is, being good Puerto Ricans, we're going to invoke the spirits in a bendición. We're going to invoke the spirits of those who came here against their will on slave ships or against the odds in the Marine Tiger. I would like to introduce for a farewell, adios, que yo te bendiga, la bien que te acompañe. Amen. Jesús Papoleto Melendez. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, okay, I was supposed to read a poem, but I just want to say something before I read my poem, because poets don't get a chance to talk unless they read it. Um, it's just that, first of all, I used to live in this neighborhood. Uh, I lived right there on 153rd and Morris Avenue, uh, and I went to, to, to um, uh, Bronxland, 138, and, and then to Morris, well, then to Clinton, and then to Morris High School, where I graduated from. Um, I hope you guys noticed all the foreign vehicles in the photograph, you know, the imports <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> I noticed that. I said, gee, that's a Honda. <laughs> I want to say that, um, yeah, these, 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 um, these photographers did a great job of documenting a lot of our history here in the South Park. If I saw it, man, that camera is having a bad <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's a chocolate camera. Yeah. Drop it up, drop it up. Don't pass out, you know? Okay. Anyway, I think, you know, the thing about, the thing that impressed me about all, all, all the artists speaking today is how they all lived in close proximity to each other. Well, you, I did too because I lived on Morris Avenue. You guys were here in Melrose Projects, y todo por ahí, PS1, y todo eso. And my good friend Pedro Pietri, the, the, the poet, right? Um, you know, Reverendo Pedro Pedro, who, who I was holding his hand when he died on an airplane trying to get back here from Tijuana, uh, Mexico, uh, he and, and his brother and myself. Well, Pedro used to go to the People's Church, the first, uh, the, 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 what is it, the, the, the first Baptist or Methodist church, i.e. on 111th Street and Lexington Avenue. And I lived on 111th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. I grew up there. I never met Pedro going to church. But... But we got to be good friends. So that's kind of like, you know, the, 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 the five and a half degrees of separation of Puerto Ricans being here. Okay, anyway. I'd like to share with you in closing a poem that I wrote about graduation. I graduated from Morris High School. And thanks to the article that David wrote for me, I, I, I got my next job through, through the article that he wrote in the New York Times. <laughs> High school, so it's like full circle. Okay, this is called um, It Was So Fly, and it's for the June 1970 graduating class of Morris High School. It goes like this. Woo!
gym. It was so fly. It was so fly. It was so fly. Let me tell you, La Marqueta was full, fuller than usual. The cheap dresses that mommy makes every day at a job and you push downtown on your Cadillac hung on racks for sale at twice your week's pay. No matter, you can chug a mug and jive and wheel and deal and get it for a dollar. The shirts came in cheap paper boxes with glass cuff, cuff links and a bow tie cheaper than the box that came in. The 100% imitation shark skin suits were for sale at your mama's welfare check and one can of peanut butter. The shoes that usually are sold to the dead lay lifeless on milk boxes for sale, and the junkies across the street nodded and laid to snatch your mama's purse. And you bought them and took them home and tried them on, and the cucarachas on the windowsill and on the dresser watched, and, and they didn't fit. And you took them back, and he didn't know you. <laughs> so, so you wore them to graduation. Congratulations, you fool. <laughs> you took a taxi, and he didn't take subway tokens or welfare cards, or Medicaid cards, or credit cards, nor peanut butter. So you, so you borrowed from friends and teachers and found you didn't have any friends. So you tried to trade your diploma for fair, and he didn't take that either. So you saw your mama. And the cucarachas laughed as they watched on the sidewalks, and the junkies across the street nodded and laid to snatch your cap and gown. You marched down the aisles and smiled, and they took your picture and grabbed your ass, and you smiled some more. And no one wore an afro, and there was no power to the people. And your gown looked like a dashiki, and it reminded you of when you wore an alpaca under yours. And you pledged allegiance and sang the alma mater and didn't know what the hell you were saying. And the speeches were fine, but you didn't know what the hell they were saying. Just some shit about you can make it, you can make it, you can make it. You can make it. <laughs> and they shook your hand and grabbed your ass and you smiled and walked down the aisles. And the cucarachas clapped and cheered and smiled. And the junkies up in the balconies shot up. Woo, Jim! It was so fly, it was so fly, it was so fly. Let me tell you, some crazy motherfucker wore sneakers, dungarees, and a sweatshirt under his cap and gown. <laughs> about each of the photographers. Everyone's doing really interesting and amazing work, so I encourage you to check out the bios, see what they're up to, and, and to, and to uh, stay engaged with us, too, at Bronx Documentary Center. We hope to see you all back. Please. We hope you all sign our mailing list if you're not already on it. Everybody is welcome to hang out, have a good time, get a beer, and uh, thank you. There's more. Uh -oh. One more thing, we're going to have Bobby Sanabri come up here and join us.
really quick. I grew up in those projects right over there, the Melrose projects. First, I remember we lived on Fox Street. Then my father said, guess what? We're moving on up. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we went, I, we lived like first, like till I was like four years old in, two, in uh, 281 and then we moved to 681 where in apartment 12A I lived. And I remember my best friend Marvin Matei at the time who lived on the ninth floor, you know, we, during the day, one summer day, we saw the New York City Department of uh, Recreation who at the, you know, the city was bankrupt and everything, but they said, wow, they're gonna, they're burning the Bronx down. We gotta do something. Let's give them free music. You know, music suits the Savage Beast. So they started building a stage out of wood and guess who played? The, ba the first band that ever fused jazz arranging technique with Afro-Cuban rhythms in 1939, the Machito Afro-Cubans. <laughs> Afro-Cuban jazz, born in New York City. Ricardo Rey and Bobby Cruz. El sonido bestial, yeah. And then, and Tito Puente. Yeah. Tito Puente. And we have uh, his son, Ronnie Puente. We're honored to have him here tonight. Hey. And his wife, John. So Marvin calls me up and he said, you know, we went up to go and finally figured out what was happening because we asked some people. Marvin calls me up. He goes, come to my, come to my apartment, because we could see the concert from, from up here. So we're looking down, we saw, you know, and we start uh, seeing Machito play. Dale jamón a la jeva, el comelona. So you know, we had to like, wow, you know, this that and the other. I was 12 years old. Marvin was like uh, 13, 14. He goes, I go, come on, man, let's go downstairs. Let's go downstairs. He goes, no, man, we could stay up here, and, you know. Let's go down. No, we can stay up here. We can throw spitballs at people. Bro. <laughs> so anyway, we go down. Machito had ended, and Tito Puente comes on. And what is he playing? Vamos, rumbero, que la rumba. Ya va a empezar. Vamos, rumbero, que la rumba. Something he wrote in 1955 that demonstrated that he was at the height of his powers. He was recording for the world's largest recording company at the time, RCA. It was a big hit, and everybody that is a fan of this music knows that on that recording, Tito Puente takes an incredible timbala solo, but he's trading with Mongo Santa Maria, his conga player at the time. So he's playing the same tune. We go down, getting cutting through the crowd. You know, people are punching us in the back because we're stepping on their feet. This, that. We get to the front, and right when like we get to the front of, of in front of Tito Puente, right when he points to the saxophone section and they stand up. And I go, wow, it's like Moses parting the Red Sea. <laughs> we got some people from the Jewish community here. So. <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, after the saxophones do this, mama ba ba da ba 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 da ba ba da ba all of a sudden. He, the climax of the song is his virtuosic virtuosity on the timbales. And it, I was, it was just like the most, you know, you have these things that change your life. That's one of the things that changed my life. And I became a musician and I've uh, been very fortunate in this business having traveled all over the world. And I always tell people I'm from the Bronx very proudly. And of course, all of those of you who are from the Bronx, if you've ever, if you've been fortunate enough to travel around the world and people start asking you where you're from, you say New York. And then you go, they go, oh, cool, you know? And then you say, well, where are you from? And he goes, the Bronx. And they go like this. <laughs> and then you go, well, what part of the Bronx? They go, well, the South Bronx. Say, oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm joking, but th that has actually happened to me. It happened in Paris, France, you know? I mean, uh, once when I was in Mongo Santa Maria. And uh, performing there, and, and, and uh, I just want to remind all of you uh, who are Bronxites, especially the young people here. This is th these these photos do not document tragedies; they document triumphs. The the uh, the will, the human spirit surviving in a time period when this city was imploding, and the thing that kept us alive was our families, the food, obviously. <laughs> and the culture. Yes. No other community in New York has been as transformative as the Puerto Rican community. We, we, you know. I 
sound like a preacher, but I was inspired by these guys. You know? No other community. We, f when we started migrating here in mass in the 30s and 40s, we completely changed this freaking city. Culturally, food-wise, musically. That's why the Jewish people love us so much. Right? Yeah. They were the only ones that would rent to us. And when the, you know, and and when Mitch Miller was doing all these corny songs and everything, you know, and trying to make uh, Frank Sinatra sing, "How much is that doggy in the wind?" or whatever, you know, <laughs> the Jewish community rejected all of that post World War II corniness and said, "No, no, I'm, uh, you know, we're gonna we, we're hanging where the soul music is, <laughs> R&B from the black community." And Latin music, is particularly Afro-Cuban music, as played by Puerto Ricans. You know, we're a very schizophrenic people, Puerto Ricans, because our music is bomba plena, the aguinaldo, seis chorreado, and all that. But the music that we love the most is Afro-Cuban music. In fact, Machito used to say all the time, Oye, tú quieres que te, que te toque la música cubana bien? Búscate un puertorriqueño de Nueva York. <laughs> Which translates into English as, Oye, tu quieres que te... <laughs> so the moral of the story is, if you took French in high school, you should have taken up Spanish. <laughs> and if you did take Spanish, you should have been paying attention. <laughs> But I'll be kind, and he used to say all the time, uh, you know, you want people to, you want somebody to play Cuban music for you good, you know, the way it's supposed to be played, get some Puerto Ricans from New York. <laughs> you know, he always used to say, no, the, the biggest protagonists of Afro-Cuban music have always been Puerto Ricans, and Mario Bazar, the musical director of Machito, the father of Afro-Cuban jazz, said, nobody has done more for Afro-Cuban music than Tito Puente. And he's Puerto Rican from New York City. He's not even Cuban. So, so we have a rich, majestic history here. But it, our, our history is tied to collaboration, family, and as we say, en conjunto. We have always welcomed people outside of our culture and our spheres into our world. If anybody that knows the heydays of salsa in the 1970s, you'd look at a band and the rhythm section the percussion, piano, bass, and everything, they, they, they'd be mostly Latinos, mostly Puerto Ricans, some Cubans, etc. But the horn players were all Anglos, mostly Jewish guys. People like Barry Rogers, who played with Eddie Palmieri, who fell in love with the music so hard that he, he made the trombone a lead instrument in what we call salsa. People like Larry Harlow, Jewish, his real name is Loris Khan, who's so, so enthralled with the music, forget it. He even became a Santero. Those of you who remember the Fania All-Stars, the only person, the first person that made Santo in, in, uh, in the Yoruba religion known as Santeria in the New World, Ifa, was a Jewish guy. It was Larry. That's how deep he was into it. Louis Kahn from Brooklyn, great Jewish trombonist and violinist. Morris Levy, the president of Roulette Records, who has the unique distinction of having been the only person in the history of the music industry to have ripped off R&B musicians, <laughs> rock and roll musicians, <laughs> doo-wop musicians, salsa musicians, jazz musicians, and the first hip hoppers. Nobody in the, in, in the music industry ever did that. If uh, you want to know what Morris was about, check out old reruns of The Sopranos, the Hesh character. He was modeled after Morris Lee. But he, he was a Sephardic Jew from the Bronx. Spoke fluent, fluent Spanish, and he loved Tito Puente. Loved him. He loved Eddie Palmieri, all these guys. Okay? The reason I'm talking so much about music is not only because I'm a musician, because most of you don't, the older people remember, but most of you don't know that this borough has produced more music has, and has had more styles of music come from this borough and also <clears throat> uh, been performed here than any other place in the United States except for one, and that's Treme in New Orleans, Louisiana. Can you imagine that? This borough was 
titanically filled with, with uh, music. There were at least 200 clubs in the Bronx. Those of you who remember the L, remember on, on, and down on Westchester, that line, and there was a, at least three bars on every block. Each bar had a small group playing, either a jazz combo, a trio, Puerto Rican trio, doing a, a boleros, et cetera, et cetera. I remember walking by near a bar <coughs> near Westchester Square, and I hear this incredible organ. I look inside, I'm 13 years old, and it's Charlie Palmieri, Eddie Palmieri's older brother playing. I remember walking by the Bronx Casino all the time with my father, looking up to see who was going to be playing. Joe Quijano, Tito Puente tonight, and the, the glass case is broken, which was, a symbolic, it was, which was symbolic of what the borough was going through. But you had greatness inside the doors, <coughs> inside that ballroom. The, who can, uh, anybody ever been to the Hunts Point Palace during its heyday? Yeah. One person. <laughs> the young people, make sure you talk to that young lady. <laughs> this borough was just filled with music. The greatest jazz musicians lived here in the Bronx. George Benson, the great guitarist, used to have a house uh, near Castle Hill. Mongo Santa Maria lived on Prospect Avenue. Jimmy Owens, the National Endowment of the, J of, uh, the, National Endowment of the Arts Jazz Master, the greatest, the highest awarded jazz musician can receive. Trumpeter, grew up in the Bronx. Elmo Hope, this incredible bebop pianist, uh, grew up here in the Bronx. Thelonious Monk used to live on Lyman's place. Mancine Sullivan had a house near him. I mean, it was amazing. In the projects where I grew up, Jerry Gonzalez. Well, yeah. hey, I'm talking. I, yeah. I know, I <laughs> anyway, the projects where I grew up, Caco, the timbala player for the Alegre All-Stars, used to live in the projects right across from me in 305. And I remember he used to come, uh, his, he used to come down and his hair was in curlers. Because he, he used to straight, get his hair straightened out like, like Al Sharpton. <laughs> Candido Rodriguez, the timbala player for Ricardo Ray, used to live in the projects. Also in my projects, 681, and his wife used to do my mother's hair. And his two, he had two twin little, twi, twin boys, little guys, little carajitos, mojoncitos, as we say. And when we used to be jamming in front of PS1 playing Cuban rumba, they used to come by and used to go, my father can kick your ass on bongos, kikongas, and timbales. <laughs> there was a great drummer, Howard King, who used to play with Gary Butts and McCoy Tyner. He was only 16 years old. He was going to music and art high school. My cousin John Collado was his best friend, and he used to live in the projects there. And one night at 3 in the morning, all of a sudden you hear, as loud as all hell. He played for one hour straight. Nobody called the cops. Nobody said anything. And when he finished, all the, you hear applause from people in the projects, man. And somebody yelled out, yo, man, why'd you fucking stop, bro? <laughs> That's the kind of environment that we lived up here that, that was, was happening in this neighborhood, despite all the, the, the craziness that was happening. So I want to remind all of the young people here that the Bronx is not a place to, uh, to, uh, to uh, evoke memories of, of uh, the burnings, etc. Uh, it should evoke memories of happiness and majesty. Majesty is a word I like to use a lot because it was a real majestic time period here in the Bronx. When people on Sunday, no matter how poor you were, you went to church and you were dressed to the nines, okay? Where there was a black barbershop right there in the corner of 153rd Street next to the uh, bodega, and I walked by one summer day, and I see a record face white person getting their hair conked. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Strained out with that acid lye hair straightener for black people because it was an Irish guy that had 
curly hair and he wanted to, you know, he was probably going to go to the Hunts Point Palace that night. He wanted to get his hair straightened out. And I'm sitting there, I'm looking at the, like this with my mouth open and the man, and the gentleman doing it goes, what's the, what's, what's the matter, young man? You never seen a white boy get his hair cocked before? And the Jewish community that was here, the German community, the Irish community, right on Morris Avenue, Papoletto can tell you, Papa, where are you? Remember you used to go get the... Uh, there was a deli, a German deli on Morris Park <laughs> Avenue, and there was an Italian fruit stand and all that stuff. Yeah. And Sal, the barber right over there, who didn't speak a word of English, and he cut my father and my hair, and they would come in, he would talk in Italian, and my father would talk to him in Spanish. And I asked my father, Bye, every time we go there, what is that guy dressed in black? reading that Italian newspaper. What does he do? He's got a black hat on and everything. He just sits there. He doesn't say anything. He goes to me, don't worry about it. He goes, he's a businessman. <laughs> so, what does this borough evoke? What we call in Santeria Ache, which is positive energy. Positive energy. So, everybody repeat after me. Ache. Ache. Born in the Bronx. Born in the Bronx. No, just say Ache. Pay attention. I tell you what you guys went to public school. Ready? After I say something, you say Ache. Ready? Born in the Bronx. Ache. With mighty, with might and majesty. Ache. We are all survivors. Ache. They took away our buildings. Ache. They took away all the music programs. Ache. They took away all the dance programs. Ache. But they couldn't take away our souls. Ache. They didn't give us 40 acres and a mule. Ache. But they gave us Los Seis del Sur. Ache. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah.